everybody. Um, sitting here today with Captain Dave Spaulding. Uh, if you're not familiar with that name, uh, hang on, you will be. Uh, this gentleman got Who his are you? first outboard motor in 1949. So we'll introduce you here in just a second. My name's Marvin Seipel. I'm third generation Clearwater. Actually went to school at Southward, as did both of my parents. And uh, Captain Dave went to school at where did you go to elementary? South Ward. South Ward right here as well. Yeah. So we've got multi-generational uh, multi generational folks here, the alumni of this <laughs> school. So the, now uh, it's the museum. And which is, of course, now the uh, Clearwater Historical Society Museum. You come down and see it. A lot, of, a lot of cool memories down here, your books and everything. So uh, the picture that you saw initially was a grinning nine-year-old Dave Spaulding with his very first outboard motor. And then the second shot that you saw was that same Captain Dave Spaulding today with, yes, that same very first outboard motor. And uh, realizing also that that was the first engine of what is now the Queen Fleet of Boats, which uh, we'll let, uh, let Dave jump into that here and describe where he's at currently today, and then we'll take you back to the, the beginning of time, so to speak, from that picture of Captain Dave when he was nine years old. So tell us a little bit about your fleet and your, your business today. Well, I've got two party boats. The uh, biggest one is 90 feet, 150 passenger. And I got an 85 passenger all day party boat. And I've got a 150 passenger excursion boat called the Sea Screamer. Goes out and looks at dolphin and goes up and down the beach. Now, what are the names of your other two uh, fishing party boats? The Super Queen and the Golf Queen. Super Queen and the Golf Queen. And you also had the Dixie Queen. I had Dixie Queen and the Golf Wind and the Miss Clearwater. Okay. Which were two of them. Those names were the same boat. Okay. And... Your history then from this picture when you were nine years old, kind of bring us up to where we are today and your progression through time in the area, uh, your various careers and some of your boats and uh, some of your adventures. Uh, I went to uh, South Ward and then I went to Clearwater Junior High and then I went to Largo Senior High. Then I went to Clearwater or St. Pete Junior College for a short time I listed in the Coast Guard Reserve and spent eight years in the Coast Guard Reserve. And uh, bought a, I became a fireman, a city fireman, and bought a couple of charter boats. And the first one was a flop. I didn't have a license or a slip for it. The second one was a success. I borrowed some money from the bank and bought a very good charter boat. Had that for five years and then another charter boat operator myself became partners in the first party boat we brought in, that was the Miss Clearwater. We had that for a couple of years. My dad ran it for us. So we still ran our charter boats, which were six passenger boats. And then uh, Herb Brower had the Dixie Queen and Super Queen sold it to us. And we ran those and rebuilt them and eventually replaced them with newer boats. And I had a, that partner was Captain Dewey Price and he was my partner for 13 years, and then he left, and I bought him out, and I've had it by myself since then. Then my son went to work with me about 20 years ago, and he now runs 95% of the business of his. He operates the business. I'm retired. That's it. <laughs> that, that's it. I'm tired, <laughs> just, hearing the, <laughs> just, tired just hearing the story. Um, wow. Uh, pr pretty impressive. Now, um, go back in, in time when you first had your first boats, you mentioned that Clearwater was a little different town than it is now, and you summered where? We used to take the small charter boats to Panama City in the summer. And, and in and the winter? marathon in the winter. Okay. Chasing the kingfish around. And there was no business in Clearwater during those months to speak of. And Clearwater was strictly a fishing community. There was no other kinds of boats at that time. Now there's sailboats and Dolphin boats and excursion boats and dinner boats and everything you can think of. So you really were at the front edge of, shall we call it, growing up on the waterfront. Um, the, the way 
Clearwater morphed from really nothing, just a, a, a sandbar, to the uh, theme park that it's become today. Um, tell us, tell us, in, do you have any any specific stories from your days as operating, perhaps the Captain Dave? That was your last boat that you operated, wasn't it? The last six passenger boat. Okay. And, uh, I, like I said, I took it to Panama City in the summer and down to the Keys in the winter. Before that, I had a $1,200 boat that Kai Lewis and I took to Panama City and got me started. And uh, I was able to sell that and move up. And I was, did a lot of odd jobs in between. I worked at an awning company and I worked for a mechanic. Like I said, I was a sewer fireman for a couple of years. Interesting, the all the different trades and careers and jobs because the waterfront was not yet mature enough to support a, a full-time job, a full-time industry. And interesting that uh, Captain Kai Lewis keeps coming up. Uh, again, he's uh, he's been around the area a long, long time. He and I started together. There you go. And uh, now tell us, your uh, the original Dixie Queen was a wooden boat, as was the Super Queen, correct? Right, and this two are also. Okay, and they're, they're all now decommissioned? Yeah, they're all gone. They all sunk eventually after I sold them. Okay, <laughs> to clarify that. The boats I have now, the two big boats are aluminum, and the 75-foot Sea Screamer excursion boat is fiberglass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original, uh, um, did you have any boats built by Clark Mills up at Clearwater Bay Marine Ways? No, I did not. Okay, but you so, did have something built at uh, Ross Yacht Service by Courtney Ross. Well, correct? I built a uh, commercial, and it was a 48-foot sport fish convertible boat, and I used it commercial fishing, and then I used it as a charter boat along with the party boats, and then it became a personal yacht boat. I had it for 40 years. And what's the name of that boat? That was the Ocean Queen. Okay, okay. And your current Viking that you have as that's your a, personal boat. Yeah, that's a 55 foot sport fish, and it's called Ocean Queen, also. So, how many total boats from the picture of you with that wooden skiff with your very first engine up to current have you know. owned? I've right had numerous small outboards, uh, probably 12, 14 boats. Most of which are still in operation and and uh, and supporting supporting multiple families. How many employees uh, do you have total with your captains we and got crews? Between twenty five and thirty now. Between twenty five and thirty employees. So, from that picture of that nine year old grinning ear to ear, up to a pretty good sized business now, supporting all those families and providing entertainment for so many that come over to Clearwater. Um, and here's an opportunity to, to share all this via podcast. But, of course, if you come on over to the museum, we've got a lot of these pictures, and uh, we're working on some pretty cool stuff here coming up in the very near future. Um, Captain Dave, do you have any stories, anything that sticks out in your mind, any time from, from that nine-year-old childhood picture up to today, whether it well, was your time at the fire service, your time on the water, I'd like to mention that my dad had a charter boat in 1950 when the marina was first built. And I worked on that with him one or two summers, and I cleaned boats after school. And he eventually sold, he had two charter boats, and he eventually sold the second one and had already sold the first and, and went to work running party boats for other people. And he ran the Miss Clearwater for Dewey Price and myself. And, uh, one notable trip was the first trip to Panama City with Kai. It was horrible weather. The boat was leaking. It was a $1,200 boat with a single gas engine in it. <laughs> if we'd have been smarter, we wouldn't have done it, but we made it there all right. We made it back home. Well, what's that saying? In order to be old and wise, you must first be young and foolish. Yeah. So Learn by your mistakes. Yes, yes. Hopefully you survive them. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, well, we've had numerous strange things happen on the party boats. Had a, a, 
a man jump off the boat in the past and almost drown as the boat was coming in. He didn't want to be saved. Finally, an outboard good saving brought him over. And we've had uh, all kinds of fish catchers and big sharks and Goliath, Goliath grouper, uh, manta rays, stingrays, all the sailfish, stuff like that over the years. You mentioned over the years, as of late, just go into the, a little bit of the contrast between what fishing was perhaps in the, in the 60s and 70s to what it is now. Well, originally there was no uh, limits on anything. You can catch as many grouper or snapper as you wanted to. Now everything is limited. Everything has a season. And we must report our catches every day. And uh, we have equipment on the boat that tells the government where we are, so they can monitor that. And uh, there's a lot of, there was no paperwork originally now. You almost have to have a secretary to keep track of everything. Yeah, things, things have changed a little bit. And uh, that's a rather expensive proposition for those federal reef permits, too, isn't it? Yeah, they are. Uh, we originally were grandfathered in, but to get one today, they're, they, they're privately owned. There's no, you can't get one from the government anymore. There's a limit to them. So you have to buy them from somebody that has one. So to, to replicate, to do today, if someone were to, to watch and listen to this and say, well, this guy, I want to be just like him when I grow up. In, in today's environment, it would be largely impossible from what I'm hearing. It would be very difficult unless you had a lot of base money. If you did, why would you want to get into a fishing business? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like that old saying, best way to in, uh, to have a, a million dollars from Start the charter. Two. Yes. <laughs> yep, so true. But it's been very good to myself and my family. I got a grandson growing up. He's 15. He's an avid fisherman now, and hopefully he'll take over after my son decides he's had enough. So that would be the fourth generation that exactly. you're working on, and that's so unusual, particularly in Florida, as folks have moved here for only for a few years in the past, and then to have the privilege of speaking with someone like yourself that has been here for uh, how. how how old were you when you first, were you born? No, I was, I was born in Ohio. We okay. moved here when I was five. Okay. So it's still got uh, still got a few more years than most people that uh, still have out-of-state plates on their car. So yeah. uh, go back. We, we mentioned Kai Lewis briefly. He said Courtney Ross of Ross Yacht Service built one of your boats. Uh, a couple of other names uh, in the era were Bob Nelson, Ress. Nelson, Nelson White's little bill, the sailboat I had. Uh-huh. And Bob Ress and I grew up together. He, he actually owned that little outboard motor before I did. And uh, he and I were great friends, and we still are today. I actually worked for him one summer building docks. Okay. And uh, for those of you who don't know who Bob Ress is, Ress Marine Construction, who is, uh, which is now owned and operated by his yeah. son, Skip, um, his dad, now uh, Bob's dad, was a marine contractor as well, wasn't he? Exactly. So it is now a third generation business, as is the uh, Queen Fleet operation, a third generation business. Kind of surprising in Florida, where, like I said before, everybody's a recent transplant. Here we're going back to people that went to school here when this was literally a, a one and, and two school community. Um, everything was, was downtown. There weren't malls. And for entertainment, you went over to the beach. Uh, do you remember when the Coast Guard Cutter Point Swift was on the uh, on the dock over there for a number yeah, of years? I, I knew the uh, captain, and he used to invite me over for dinner, a steak dinner on a Saturday night on the Coast Guard Cutter. We, used to, we would work with each other and help each other out. We used to do the same thing. I was a kid down there, and uh, we'd spend summers on a buddy's sailboat. We just lived on the sailboat in the yeah. marina, and many a Saturday night sat over there in the in the cruise compartment watching uh, watching the, watching television with the enlisted guys. Which of course now you get within 100 yards of anything military, you're subject to uh, subject to arrest. Yeah. That was a uh, different yeah, era then. Another interesting thing, a fellow named Robbie Robinson was a semi-famous uh, painter and artist. 
he and my dad made friends in 1950, and I used to sail with him on his boat. He was an avid sailor. I learned a lot about sailing. And later on, I sailed as a young kid on the uh, Sea Scout boat with Courtney Ross and Skipper Quinn. I can't remember who else. All young guys we were learned. And then we also sailed prams with Optimus Pram Fleet. So I had a lot of fun growing up in Clearwater on the waterfront. Yes, yes, as, as did I. Now, uh, I remember Bob Ress uh, mentioning some time that he had spent around uh, Donald Roebling as a youngster. Mm -hmm. um, did you have much interaction with Mr. Roebling? The main thing with Mr. Roebling, he gave out, uh, maybe I, I think I mixed up, there was one Halloween they gave out quarters and we all kept getting in line to get a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Donald Roebling was a generous guy and uh, we used to go down, hang out at his boathouse and look around years ago. We weren't invited, but we kind of climbed the fence. He never seemed to mind much. Yep, I did. I did the same thing. It was past the Roebling era, but nonetheless, to yeah. to climb that wall and uh, go into that pool or try to get through that <laughs> boathouse with silt that was six feet deep, and uh, yeah, that was it was a fun place to grow up. No, no question. Yeah, about I grew that. up on Roger Street, right a couple of blocks away, right over by Martin Plant Hospital. I was the other way. Roger Street by the courthouse. Oh, okay. Yes, Rogers uh, yeah. uh, down. Down, down by Turner Street and uh, and there's Harbor Oaks, which was kind of like yes. a more uh, upscale neighborhood. Yes, those are the neighborhoods we walked through to get where we were going. So. <laughs> exactly. <yes. laughs> well, uh, great, uh, great stories and so many memories. Um, if, if, uh, is there anything that you would like to to mention? Anything you would like to speak to? Again, we talked about your connection to Courtney Ross to Bob Ress to uh, Kai Lewis. How about Wally Erickson? Uh, yeah. did you, he was north of here, but did you ever cross uh, paths with him? Well, when I bought my good charter boat, Nick Lopez owned it, and he wouldn't sell it to me until he fished some uh, rotten plywood in the deck, and Wally Erickson did the work. And uh, I had to wait patiently for that to get done, but he did wonderful work. Yeah. And he and uh, Madison Whitefield built boats together. And he was in Tarpon Springs on the river. No, he was in uh, Palm Harbor. In Palm Harbor, okay. All right, now, Wally Erickson today, he's, uh, he's still with us. Um, his family was involved in a lot of the uh, uh, waterfront development, as was Bob Ress. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Just, I remember, for instance, when the Clearwater Bay Marineways Basin was constructed. Uh, Bob telling stories of using dynamite to blast the rock. Yeah, I remember him telling me about that. <laughs> and he, I guess he had a license. So we, uh, together, we got a hold of some of his dad's dynamite and blew a stump up <laughs> in his backyard, right behind Morton Plant Hospital. <laughs> got us in a little trouble, I guess. Well, I think the statute and of limitations, I think we're clear on that now. My so. first car, I paid $25, $26 for it. And I took it to Bobby's house, and we cut the top off of it with a torch in the backyard. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, growing up in Clearwater was wonderful. Yes, yes it was. It's a, a big city now. Now, your boats were originally uh, not at the Clearwater Marina where they are today, correct? Well, the uh, Dixie Queen started out on the other side of the causeway on the north side. Okay, behind what? But he the... her, excuse me, her brower owned it, and he eventually moved it to the marina. Okay, that was behind at the time what was known as the King Cole Motel, if yes. I recall. And the Miss Buckeye was over there later on, I guess. There was, a, at one time, there was 12 or 13 party boats in Clearwater Marina alone. 12 or 13 now there's just party four. boats. There's just four. And yeah, a fellow that worked for me, Sandy Haggard, ended up owning the Double Eagle, and his son now runs that, as well as my son running our business. So the four charter boats, or excuse me, party boats mm -hmm. at Clearwater Marina, how many of those are yours? Two. Two of them. So and you... the Double Eagle, one and two are, are Sandy okay. Haggard. Okay. And Chad, his son Chad. So you own half of the party boat fleet 
in Clearwater. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is because, as you stated early on, when there were none, yeah. and it wouldn't even support uh, one family on a year-round basis. You had to go north in the summer and south in the winter. Um, reflect back on the time when Clearwater was growing sufficiently that you could see, okay, I can stay in Clearwater all year and, and make it. Well, I was that kind of forced to stay in Clearwater. I got married. And my <laughs> wife said, you're not going to Panama City anymore. <laughs> so I stayed in Clearwater. I still went to the Keys in the winter time because that was lucrative. And I spent two or three months in the marathon which was strictly a fishing community. There's nothing else there. Mm -hmm. Keys are different these days, too. Yeah. Well, at what point did, uh, did did this area really change? When did you see it take off? I think it was a gradual change over a period of time. I can't put any particular date on it, but it, it eventually grew into a full-time resort area. With a lot, of, And you can imagine all the hotels we have now you could see one or two major hotels, now there's dozens of them. Big difference. It's yeah. a, what, what a big town. Well, the island of states at the time started out as just, uh, just man, a series of mangroves. Yeah, it was mangroves. We used to go over and visit a hermit that lived over there. He was a mullet fisherman. And he had a boat pulled up in the mangroves and lived on it before they pumped up the, uh, the island. The Great Bay Company built island of states. What was his name? What was the hermit? The hermit you I saying? can't tell you now. I can't remember. <laughs> Just the old hermit on the island. He's a real nice guy. He's real good to us kids. And yeah. We go visit him. And I camped out over there with a buddy of mine, Skipper Quinn, whose dad ran a party boat in Clearwater. And uh, they eventually moved over there and bought a house after they built about 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Nylon States was developed in three phases, wasn't it? Well, two major phases. Right. The uh, initial, yeah. which was uh, windward, leeward, midway, and island uh, yeah. uh, passage, passageway. And then yeah. the two Her little... Harold Hyer, Harry Armstrong, yeah. and Mr. Skinner were the three partners in Great Bay okay. that built it. And then the big expansion was the one that's to the north that goes mm -hmm. clear up to... This is where I live now. Okay. So you still kind of on the island with a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't move. I only had three houses in my life. What was school like back then? It was boring. And <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't much of a student. I I wanted to be on the water and playing with boats. And uh, a friend of mine is an airline pilot. He grew up here. And, Teacher told him, he said, you'll never make a living staring out a window. He said, I proved you wrong. <laughs> that reminds me of, of another story, similar kind of thing as to trying to teach how the crop rotation and coffee beans or something in whatever part of the, of the world. And uh, one fellow got up and said, oh, what you need to teach us is how to be able to make enough money to buy the coffee. We're never going to be coffee bean. Got sent to the office. And the principal had really had little choice but to agree with him. <laughs> and uh, he crawled out the window at Clearwater High School, said, I've had enough. Bought an old, I forget, model something, an old uh, rumble seat car, took a seat out of the back, put in a mud box, and went laying tile. And that man's name was J.C. Weaver. I know J.C. very well. Yeah. He owns lots of real estate. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But, you know, we talk about a story of, a, a you know, just a, a, a dumb guy that had a vision, yeah. and then he went on to he invent. Stuck with it. Yep, and invented then set and invested his money in land that at the time people were like, "What? Well, Island Estates was that way too." Yeah. Uh, who wants to buy that stinky bay bottom that got sucked up? Yeah. You want five thousand dollars for a vacant lot? Are you nuts? That was I, a lot of I had an older then. sister that uh, went to work for after she graduated at Florida. Went to work for the city as a community relations mm -hmm. coordinator and became assistant city manager for 17 years. Went on to become city manager of Flagler Beach before she retired. So, Clearwater is a good place to grow up and yep. to go with the city. Yep. 
you sort of answered my next question already. I was going to ask, discuss a little bit what you did after school, but it sounds like you were uh, kind of much like me, right straight to the water. Yeah, I went down and played at Haven Street Dock. Uh, Talking Mills had a couple of boats there he'd let us use. Had an air-cooled engine, a uh, gig, colored gigging boat, just a big open plywood boat. He had a sailboat and he let us play on it. He was, he was building prams at the time of his dad's house where the courthouse now stands. And we'd go down watching. He was, he was very patient with his people, especially kids. All he, all he wanted to do was share his knowledge, I think. Quite a, quite a craftsman. He was a hell of a craftsman, yes. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, uh, Bob Ress has a, a boat named Clark Mills. Yeah, he's got a tugboat named Clark Mills yeah. that Clark he built for yeah. Tampa, Man. Yeah. I was just trying to, you know, do some different things about what y'all did growing up because, you know, like... Everything, obviously every, everything in, in growing up was centered around the water somehow. For me it was. Okay. Well, and again, that's that's what made Clearwater what it was for residents like you. Because you've been here for these years and you saw it change. In fact, at the time you didn't realize you were instrumental in that change. And looking no, back I was just now... my life. Yeah, and looking back now, you can look at the things that, so to speak, have your fingerprints on them. There's a, a, a lot of those little pieces of, of Clearwater. I don't want to talk about everything. I got my fingerprints on <laughs> <laughs> Well, we checked the statute of limitations before we started, so we're, we're good. So we're good. And uh, we've got a, a whole bunch of pictures here that uh, we've gone through with a really cool photo album with a lot of pictures of the various boats, some of the catches. And some of these pictures where the dock is just covered with fish, as you mentioned, with restrictions and bag limits today and having to have permits, long gone are the days of just let's go fishing. Well, we, we made a good part of our income selling fish on a charter boat. You can no longer do that because you're limited how many you can keep. And uh, we used to sell filleted fish right at the dock to people who come down and buy them. We're not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah, you've got to have a commercial products license to, yeah, to buy and sell. You've got to have a screened-in area to clean them, and yeah. all governed by the various municipalities. Yes, we're from the government. We're here to help. Yeah. <laughs> Was, uh, what were the, the best fish to catch back then? What were drawing the highest dollar? I know today we look at grouper, snapper, kingfish uh, for well, the offshore. The kingfish were very plentiful until the... Uh, First trainers kind of wiped them out, mm -hmm. and then uh, grouper has always been sought after. Back in those days, we got ten or fifteen cents a pound. Now it's probably two or three dollars a pound on the hoof. Now we're. I'm trying to remember. Was grouper considered kind of like a not not a really high class fish that was just no? A it was always good. Okay, I knew it was always good. Yeah, but my dad would keep barracuda and sell everything else. Okay. And we grew up eating barracuda because the restaurant wouldn't buy the barracuda. And uh, uh, were there many mahi? No. Okay. They're more or less offshore. We catch them occasionally, right. but offshore you get them. You got to go 80, 100 miles offshore for marlin and, and uh, dolphin and stuff like that. Of course, the boats were so different then. How many of your charter boats had gasoline engines? as opposed to diesels. Well, the first ones were all gas. Right. My second boat had diesels. It was one of the first boats that had diesels put in it. About when was that? Oh, 60, early 60s, I'm not sure. Interesting. And of course, now everything is diesel, and so yeah. many are outboard. And the yeah. length of time it would take you to get out that 80 to 100 miles then. Well, the fast boat then was 12, 15 knots. Yeah. Now it's 35, 40 knots. Yeah. And that 35 and 40 knots you're talking about are still a big boat like what you're running that used to go 12 to 15. Of course, these uh, the outboards now with multi-engines that are running 50 and 60. Yeah. Get out to fishing grounds like mm -hmm. that. And of course, just, a big outboard now would be a million, million and a half dollars. Yep. Or center console. Yeah, and with what you can't keep recreationally, 
that makes fish what a couple hundred dollars an ounce. <laughs> you can't even figure it that way. People just do it for a sport. Oh sure, I remember. In fact, it was on the Dixie Queen. I would go out on the half day boat. I would take both trips. I would deadhead, so I would work on on the boat, cutting bait, whatnot, cleaning the boat on the way back. And the fish that I wore seafood was down there, and I think they were paying at the time. I remember 20 or 25 cents a pound on the hoof for grouper. And I was making $20 a weekend. Oh, I mean, yeah. that was, you know, that uh, was, was common. big money yeah. back then for a 12 year old kid. Uh, absolutely. And that, that love of the waterfront has, has never left. Obviously, in your case, you moved here at five years old and uh, probably had your feet wet within a week. <laughs> and, uh, Still doing it. Still, still doing it. Still at it. Now, how often do you run your boat, the Viking? Not so much lately. I, when I first got, I've had it about 10 years. When I first got it, I took it to the Keys and the Bahamas and stuff a lot. But um, with COVID, it kind of shut things down. And then the fuel got so expensive and the docking is so expensive. And I also fly an airplane. That got expensive. And so I, I do it. I just keep it because I like having it more than using it. Yeah, it's fun, fun to go look at. Uh, something to spend money on. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was no such thing as a free boat. Yeah, that's right. Now, you mentioned with dockage and so forth. What back in the day when you were first uh, putting boats in the water, contrast what it was like around a marina then compared to now. Uh, the kinds of people, the amounts of people, the amount of boats, just kind of a then and now, now contrast, if you could. Well, I don't quite know how to start that. Uh, originally, there was just fishing and fishing boats at the marina. Mm -hmm. And now it's evolved into all kinds of excursion boats and wave runners and dinner boats. And we got four dinner boats at Clearwater, or three of them now. And uh, like the Sea Screamer came along, and I bought that about 10 years ago, and it's very popular. And it goes for an hour or so, and people get to see the dolphins jump beside the boat. We take them for a little speedboat ride up and down the beach. Yeah, that's, a, that's pretty neat. And at the time, you mentioned, uh, you had mentioned this before as well, the marina was largely a commercial venture between commercial fishing boats and party boats, charter boats. And it's evolved now to recreational and a working waterfront. Yeah. Um, would you say that today it's more recreational than working waterfront between recreational boats and fun stuff to do? Probably half and half. Okay. How hard is it to, let's say I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. So I go buy a boat and I just go to the marina and say, hi, right, I'm here and I want to get a slip. Good luck. Good luck. There's a limited number of slips, and they cost a lot of money about to buy boats in a slip. What a lot of the young guys do now, they get a uh, bay boat or a flat boat and keep it on a trailer, and they right. do quite well working off a trailer. And then that way they're allowed to go north and down to Boca Grande and travel around where the fish are and do whatever anybody wants to do. So I'm hearing that there's not a lot of dock space left in the area? Not commercial space. Okay. Even recreationally, I understand most of the marinas, the dry stacks, everybody's got a waiting list for boat storage in or near the water. Yeah, we, there's nothing available, really. There's one new marina that was built uh, at a hotel just north of the causeway, and they're filling up rapidly. And that goes back full circle to the growth, remember? When we started this, Clearwater was a sleepy little fishing town, and the only enterprise on the waterfront was charter boats and commercial fishing. Yeah. And now, you can't even find a space. That's right. As a as a kid, did you ever jump off either the Clearwater Pass Bridge or the Memorial Causeway? Or I jumped off Clearwater Pass Bridge with the, the big pass in the north end. The guys used to swim across it. I wouldn't do that. It was too far. Now you can walk across yeah. it. <laughs>
Yep, I've jumped off the Clearwater Pass Bridge many times, oh, yeah, too. Yeah, we did that for fun. Yep, we'd get somebody on either side watching you when you didn't land on a boat that was going under. Okay, Be clear. Before they built the bridge, Santee was his favorite place to go have a bonfire. Oh, I remember that. They'd take the little boats over and cook hot dogs and drink beer or something. Uh-huh. And we even had bonfires on Clearwater Beach and nobody bothered you. The police uh -huh. would tolerate about anything. Well, they couldn't really get to you, either. Well, I mean, beaches. we do it on the beach in Clearwater. Right, but they couldn't, they, they'd have to walk to yeah. get to you. But they didn't care. The kids weren't causing any trouble. Right. Now, they, the Clearwater Pass Bridge. they got rules for everything now. And how. The Clearwater Pass Bridge was put up, if I recall correctly, in 1962. Yeah, it was yeah. a drawbridge. Yes, yes. And then the city dredged it, and they kind of over dredged it, and they started thinking they had to tear it down to build a fixed bridge. The one that's there now. Yeah, I remember many a many a weekend night again, big bonfires. Everybody would bring a couple of pallets, and a yeah. couple of times we had such such big piles out there. I'm sure you could see it from the mainland. Yeah, big bonfires out there, football games. Mm -hmm. And the 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 one time the cops came out there, they uh, they would always, because of course that soft sand, they couldn't drive out in that with a car. They all had cars at the time. Right. They would park up by the toll booth, leave the overhead lights on, be like, oh, here they come. <laughs> Ten minutes later when they walk out there, I'll never forget the time they borrowed that old Willie's Jeep that the water department had. And you see the headlights come bouncing out there like, wonder who that is. Very few people had, you know, four-wheel drive was right. well, uncommon then. You'd look around and say, well, he's here, he's here, he's here. Gee, I don't know who that is. Here come the cops in the, in the Jeep they borrowed from the water department. So, <laughs> But they were good. When we did get stopped, they would uh, kind of tell you to not do whatever you were doing wrong. Or if you yep. were drinking, they'd just take you home to your dad. And it was, it was, like I said, it was a whole different arrangement with the city. It was. And I think in a lot of cases, they knew the, the players were always the same. It was your group of kids. You typically hung out in the same area. The same. We knew the good cops, and they knew us. Yep, and harmless fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I refer to myself often as a wharf rat just because I hang around the waterfront so yeah. much, and there, there's a bunch of us. So, what? Uh, in, anything else come to mind? Any, Not necessarily. Just a, we used to, there used to be a small marina building where the marina that sits now. They tore it down, and we had outboards down there. I used to fish for Pompano uh, with a guy named Johnny Williams in his boat. We'd sell them when I was a young kid. And we stone crab, you know, go out and catch stone crabs or have traps and sell those, try to make a few bucks. Never made much money. But had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun at the time. That's that's the key, having having a good time. I started out selling papers for the Clearwater sign. That was, I think I made three cents a piece. Yep. On a big day, I sell twenty or thirty papers. And the boat called the Sea Fever was downtown before they built the marina. I remember that. That was on, on Smith beach. Finger, right? Yeah, right there. Okay. And the city dock, and I cleaned fish for the people who come off the boat, and they tipped me. And I was a young kid, and they had over overpaid me for it. it it was much better than selling papers. <laughs> <laughs> so I just stuck with that the rest of my life. Been, been cleaning fish since uh, since you were a kid. Yeah. So, well, great. It was uh, really enjoyable to chat with you today. Um, is if there's anything else that uh, that that you'd like to uh, like to mention or uh, just discuss any memories that have been prompted by this conversation, um, feel free to go ahead and throw those in here. Uh, again, it's just in, in conclusion, what a great area this was to grow up in uh, and to be a part of history. Basically, just, I got to do something I really loved and made a success of it and, uh, and got very comfortable financially because of it. Well, I was able to pass it on to my son and my grandson, so that's the main thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's doing a lot right there. And the old saying, if you find a job that you really like, you never work another day in your life. Yeah. I didn't know I was working. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Get up in the morning and go fishing. Oh, yeah, that's right. I get paid. <laughs>
and put the name of the So what is the name of, of your your company currently? It's Clearwater Marine Enterprises Incorporated. I did a corporation when I had a partner years ago. And we kept that and all the boats were under that, but they had their own special name, you know. Right. They call it the Queen Fleet because the two big boats are named Golf Queen and Super Queen. <laughs> well, and everybody knows the name Dave Spaulding is synonymous with Clearwater Beach, synonymous with uh, fishing uh, out of that marina. I, mean, you, I don't think I've been there a long time. <laughs> exactly. I don't think anybody could walk down that dock and mention your name. I, I'd be surprised if, if anybody went, who? Well, now they say who, and they know who Eric Spaulding is. Yeah. <laughs> My son is more popular than that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. So I'll meet people and say, oh, you're Eric's dad. I said, yeah, that's yep. me. <laughs> yep. Somebody started this. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. I think that's, uh, that about wraps up. Uh, uh, if there's anything else that you have, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. It's truly an honor to be able to speak with one of, one of the, with all due respect, elders of of the area here because you're That's very nice of you, Mom. And I appreciate it. I'm glad we got together. And you go way back. I remember eating your dad's restaurant. Yep. And it brings back a lot of good memories. Yes, it does. And that's what the that's what the museum, the the whole of the museum experience is about is the memories. We've got an old mullet skiff out there. Kai Lewis's son. You mentioned him. Zach helped us find that. We uh, a local towing company donated her truck and her time. We went and got that boat. Restored it, got an engine donated, and so now we've oh, got wonderful. our own little our own little uh, memorial uh, tribute, uh, if you will, to fishing in the area. Yeah. So. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate thank you. It, Mom. Like I told you, I spent eight years at South Ward, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, second grade. <laughs> 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 first grade well, like I, I I grew up on those. The stilt houses outside of Newport Ritchie. Oh yeah. Yeah, my family owned the one that was the furthest north. Oh, I'll be darned. Yeah, so I forget the name. It's Sal Salty Pelican. That yeah. was the name of the marina we went in and out of. Oh, and um, really yeah, then we used to have the shrimp. The shrimp guys used to stop by and give us shrimp on the way back. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. If they had a good night, my dad would bring that. Give them co fresh coffee if they get. I used to go out with the shrimp bay shrimpers to get uh, bait. Bait shrimp. shrimp. Yeah. Why did Clearwater Bay? And then Buff's dock on the beach, we talked about that, became Pat Keith had. Okay. You worked there and I yep. worked there. And originally they would rent wooden outboards and people bring their own motors. I remember that. Or they would rent a motor. Yep. And they had two or three commercial guys that go out and catch trout for a living, commercial fishing in the bay. So it's. Evolved from lots of stuff. Yep, and then there was Al Jones bait stand yeah. down in the corner there by Smith's Finger. Yeah, I worked I worked for about a month one summer catching bait, and I remember I would just come around the corner and work along the waterfront down there along Roebling's property down down in there catching pinfish. Yeah, like I made like a. Middle. I told you about the old gentleman caught pinfish outside the marina in a little boat. Everybody loved him. He was a charter boat captain father. He was about nine years, 90 some years old. And lightning hit him and killed him. It was so sad right there in the boat. Hmm. But he lived a hell of a life up there then. So you never know. No, you don't. There's no guarantees. But lightning hit him while he was in the boat? Yeah, he was in a little outboard just catching bait fish, pinfish. And lightning just hit him. Wiped him out. That's his time. Yeah. Well, another eerie story of talking about going out of, of the time. Remember Groover's Chevron? They owned the Chevron station here at the corner of Chestnut and uh, Fort Harrison. It was a standard oil in Chevron. Where was it? On the corner of Court and, uh, or excuse me, Chestnut and Fort Harrison. It's a vacant lot now. It was a standard station mm -hmm. Chevron. Well, I, I vaguely remember it. I worked at three gas stations. Along the way. Well, coming off the beach, you put you passed it every time you yeah. go on it. Also, but anyway, uh, the old fellow that owned that, Gene Groover, uh, he was a twin, and his brother would join him. Well, he spent winters here. Gene was here full time, ran a station. His brother would come down, just hang out at the station for you know, for three or four months that he was there. 
Um, and they were killed in a traffic accident on Bel Air Road. I forgot which one of them was driving, but the Bel Air Road was not that fast a, a road. And killed them both in the accident. I, I don't think they hit another vehicle, but one of them had a medical issue and veered off the road, and they both died in the accident. Twin brothers, twin boys. Yes, What's the chances? You know, they, they were born minutes apart, and they went out the, the same way. Again. But what's the chances of both of them being in the same place at the same time on that day? They were in the same car? Yeah. Oh, they were. Yeah. But that, that I mean, you know, they didn't do that much stuff, you know, all the time together. And well, Bobby and I hung out at a gas station across from Little Big Market on Fort Harrison. I remember Little Big Market. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name. He let us work on our cars and put them on the list. And we had a hell of a good time. And I worked at one of the corner of uh, Druid and Missouri, and I worked at the yep. Phillips station at Court, Missouri. Yep. Now, where was the one uh, by a little big? Was it south of it on the same side of the road? North of it, just a little bit on the other side of the road. Okay. I don't remember that gas station. The name, name almost comes. Bobby would remember his name. He's very good with that. And Marcus Sully was our buddy that his family ran the little big market. Yep, I remember I remember that well. Yeah. A lot of stories whenever you go in there to you know, getting a bottle cap because you could get free movie theater. Yeah. Uh, on Saturday morning. Got a bunch of R C caps and we go around construction sites and get the get the bottles you can Bobby got there. run over and down by the Ritz theater on uh, Fort Harrison and broke his leg real bad. He's, they were able to patch him up. He worked up there. It probably still bothered him some, but he had a bad accident. Another friend of mine, Fred Hill, got hit right here on Turner Street, right around the corner. And he had a cast on his waist up to his neck like okay. that. I still see him in the hospital. But I got lucky. I didn't break a bone yet. <laughs> I'm <with> you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>